the Nile. It really needs no introduction. The most famous of all rivers, for centuries it was regarded also as the world's longest at around 6,650 kilometers. But this claim has recently been challenged by the Amazon River of South America, as they are coincidentally so close in length, it has been difficult to determine which is the longest from estuary to furthest source. Unlike the mighty Amazon, however, the Nile has a relatively small flow, due to much of its length being in the Sahara Desert, that provides no contribution in terms of rainfall, but rather takes water from the river in evaporation in the desert heat. Despite its importance in world history, its source remained a mystery until relatively recently, and vexed the ancients, mystified at the unusual timing of its floods. The word Nile comes to us from the Latin Nilus, itself believed to have come from the Semitic Nahal, meaning valley. The ancient Egyptians called the river Ar, meaning black, alluding to the dark colour of the sediments carried down the river, in stark contrast to the pale sands of the Sahara. Our geographic journey begins at its end, the Nile Delta that flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Described by Strabo in the first century as having seven main branches, the flow has since this time been diverted such that there are now only two. Its prototypical triangular shape, known to the ancient Greeks as early as Herodotus of the 5th century BC, spawned the geographic term delta, since that Greek letter is in the shape of a triangle. It is here that much of the sediment of the Nile is deposited, up to 20 metres deep in places and constitutes the most fertile soil in Africa. The vast majority of Egypt's 100 million plus population is confined to the delta and floodplain of the Nile, as so little rain falls in Egypt that the population is almost completely dependent upon the river for its vital water supply. The Nile also acts as a key navigable waterway for the transport of goods as well as people. The Nile flows as a single river throughout Egypt and northern Sudan. At various points along the whole course of the river, there are rapids known as cataracts, and the first of these is where today's Aswan Dam is. More on that dam later. The seasonal river Atbara joins the Nile in northern Sudan, and during the summer peak accounts for a fifth of the Nile's flow. But it's at Sudan's capital, Khartoum, where the two most important tributaries join to the United Nile downstream. Here, the Blue and White Niles join. The two Niles were so named owing to their very different colours that result from the differing geology that they pass over on their long journeys. Despite its shorter length, the Blue Nile contributes most of the downstream flow annually, with up to 70% of the peak flow in summer. The Blue Nile has a dramatic descent from the Ethiopian highlands at 2,000 metres through a series of gorges over 1,000 metres deep. In Ethiopia, the rainy season is in summer, and these seasonal rains are responsible for the yearly flood of the Nile. As it takes some time for the surge in water to reach downstream, however, the flood doesn't peak in Egypt until September and October. The White Nile and its tributaries are much longer, but the flow more constant. It delivers 80% of the total Nile flow at the lowest point during April and May, but is dwarfed by the Blue Nile in summer, delivering only 10% of the total flow in August. The White Nile by name ends at the wetland of South Sudan, known as the Sud. Here the land is so flat that the river breaks up into hundreds of channels across tens of thousands of square kilometres. The wetland acts as a barrier to navigation, owing to the mass of vegetation that choke the multitude of streams. Beyond the Sud, the river becomes the Mountain Nile, or Al-Jabal River, rising in a series of rapids to Lake Albert on the borders of Uganda and Congo. From Lake Albert, the river is known as the Victoria Nile, since this last major segment is sourced by the giant Lake Victoria, the world's second largest freshwater lake. Because of its size, 
the lake is sourced by many rivers, with none standing out amongst the others in terms of length or flow, and so the Nile as an identifiable river ends with this lake. The most distant source of the Nile's waters is still not clear, although a recent search has identified that the headwaters of the Kagera and Ravubu rivers in Burundi are the most likely location. These lands that bore the source of the Nile in the heart of the East African highlands were a complete mystery to outsiders, not just in ancient times but throughout the medieval and later periods. The source of the Nile did not enter recorded history until only 160 years ago, a remarkable fact considering the river's importance throughout history. The waters of the Nile and their dark, rich sediments provided possibly the earliest irrigation in human agriculture. Its constant year-round flow of water, in combination with the year-round heat and strong sunlight, meant intensive agriculture was possible in Egypt, making it unique within the Mediterranean world. These waters flooded during late summer, depositing their rich sediments across a wide area. The timing of the flood was a phenomenon at odds with the ancient Greek and Roman experience of all other rivers being in flood during winter. Peak rains in the Mediterranean occur in the cooler season. We know today that this summer Nile flood is due to the monsoonal pattern of rain over the headwaters of the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, which receives most of its rain in summer, the opposite pattern of rainfall to that of the Mediterranean. In ancient scripture, the Nile played a key role in the book of Exodus of the Bible, with its waters carrying the infant Moses in a basket of reeds. Moses would later lead the Israelites from slavery within Egypt, but only after Pharaoh relented, following the ten plagues visited upon the land. It is believed that the ancient Egyptians had knowledge of the Nile as far as its confluence at today's Khartoum and possibly as far as Lake Tana in Ethiopia up the Blue Nile. This area of the Upper Nile, known as Nubia, was home to various kingdoms with the Kushites being the most successful, reaching a peak in the 8th century BC, but continuing until the end of antiquity, with their capital of Meroe on the banks of the Nile just north of today's Khartoum. Egypt was the last Mediterranean kingdom to be conquered by the Roman Empire in 30 BC, and was prized due to it being the most fertile region known to them, owing to the waters of the Nile. In this period, Egypt became known as the breadbasket of the empire, due to its prodigious harvests of wheat, so it could be said that the waters of the Nile, originating within the heart of East Africa, fed much of the Roman Empire. The source of these incredibly important waters became an obsession for many Romans, and one of these was that most famous of emperors, Nero. In 66 AD, he ordered an expedition up the Nile to find its source. The journals of this expedition are recorded by Pliny the Elder and Seneca the Younger. They agreed that the weed-choked channels of the Sud acted as a barrier to the expedition's progress, although there is a curious reference to a waterfall flowing through two pillars to the south which would suggest that somehow they'd gone beyond the flatlands of the Sud into the mountain Nile, but more likely that they'd either heard tales of such geography from those that they'd met along the way, or perhaps had invented them entirely. In 150 AD, the great Egyptian geographer Ptolemy described the source of the Nile as belonging to the Mountains of the Moon, apparently from an earlier report by the supposed merchant Diogenes, who had claimed to have found the source within a series of lakes nestled among snowy peaks. Now, sharp-eyed geographers among you would know these as the Renzori Mountains on the border of Uganda and Congo, close to the actual sources of the Nile established today. This might be the cause of great excitement, were it not for the fact that Ptolemy's mountains of the moon were much further north, an imagined chain of mountains running west from Ethiopia across Sudan, which in fact do not exist as Sudan is largely flat. This was the established view of the source of the Nile for the next 17 centuries. In the 1800s, the British Empire continued to extend itself around the world, with Africa being no exception. Egypt, Sudan and Kenya had fallen to the British at various times in this century, and the Royal Geographic Society of London 
saw that this situation could finally resolve the matter of the source of the Nile through a series of expeditions into the terra incognita of the Dark Continent. The explorers John Hanning Speak and Richard Burton were the first Europeans to see Lake Victoria in 1858, travelling up from the East African coast at Zanzibar rather than attempting the passage down the Nile through the impenetrable sud. The explorers both claimed to have confirmed that Lake Victoria was the source of the Nile and later had a very public falling out over the matter. But it was Speak without Burton in 1862 that correctly located the outlet of the Nile on the northern shore of Lake Victoria and linked the famous river and lake in that way. As mentioned earlier, we know Lake Victoria to be fed by many headwaters and many expeditions have been conducted in the time since Speak to try to find the most distant source with the Kagera and Ravubu rivers in Burundi currently thought to be the furthest. But the discovery of Lake Victoria appeared to have settled the burning question for most as to the source of the Nile, the longest running mystery in geographical history. The most significant development in modern times to affect the Nile was the building of the Aswan High Dam in southern Egypt that began in 1960. The dam's main purpose was to regulate the amount of water passing downstream, which used to vary considerably year upon year. Too much led to devastating floods, too little to a poor harvest and famine. Upon its completion in 1970, the millennia of annual floods in Egypt finally came to an end as the seasonal flood from the Blue Nile is absorbed within the 168 cubic kilometre capacity of Lake Nasser formed upstream of the dam. Due to its location within the Sahara Desert, however, the lake loses between 10 and 30% of water annually through evaporation. Another benefit is the dam providing 2 gigawatts of power through its hydroelectric turbines. Another larger dam on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia is currently in the filling phase and has been the cause of considerable tensions between this country and Egypt. Construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam began in 2011 and when completed will provide 5 gigawatts of much needed power to Ethiopia and could advance economic development of that country considerably. Egypt has disrupted funding of the dam from international partners resulting in delays in construction and claims that the dam will reduce the flow downstream. While this is certainly true during the filling phase, it is unclear how this would be the case during operation post-filling. So this greatest of rivers, spanning millennia of recorded history, even today writes a new page of history with a dam that could transform the country whose rains once produced that seasonal flood so far downstream, that flood which led to the development of that great civilization and prompting questions across the millennia over the mystery of its faraway source. And that's it for this video. Please like and share if you enjoyed it or found it useful. And please let me know your thoughts in the comments, especially if you've traveled to this region or live there and if I missed out anything that you feel is important. If you haven't already done so, then please click the subscribe button so you don't miss future episodes. You can also support future development of this channel by becoming a member. Just click the join button below the video. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.